Thank you.
you doing, huh?
And I can't seem to find my way over I've been wondering, I'm lost As I travel
Okay. I mean, I know that, that you guys played in, in Vicky Betts band together, yeah. for instance, and uh, you and your former bass player Alan Woody played in the Allman Brothers, but what made you start Government New? Well, Matt and I had played in the Dickie Betts band for about two and a half or three years together. Uh, and then when the Allman Brothers reformed in 89, they invited me to be part of the band. So the Dickie Betts band disbanded so they, to make way for the Allman Brothers. Uh, and that's where I really became friends with Alan Woody. Uh, and then a few years later, which was 94, uh, Woody and I were listening to some music on the bus traveling with the Allman Brothers one night. We were probably listening to Cream or Hendrix or some trio. And uh, Woody made the comment, you know, nobody does that anymore. It sure would be nice to see bands exploring that, uh, you know, improvisational trio thing again. And he said, you know, me and you and the right bass player, um, me and you and the right drummer could do that. And I thought of Matt. So we called Matt. Matt was living in Los Angeles. And we said, we're going to be there in a couple of weeks. Why don't we get together and jam? And so we jammed at this club one night. And it was spectacular. And we just thought, wow, we should start a band. But Woody and I were still in the Allman Brothers, so it was just originally going to be like a project to do for fun. But it just kind of snowballed from there and got better and better. So originally it was a power trio, but now, like especially after the break, after um, um, Alan Woody died, you're like officially a four-piece band now and obviously yeah. we didn't want to really try to recreate what we already had there's just no point in doing that we already did it and uh, after Alan died uh, we wanted to change the format uh, somewhat and uh, the first thing to do was uh, to bring keys uh, keyboards into the band and uh, uh, we love playing in the quartet at this point it's it's the way to go does this affect the songwriting process as well? Well, I think it makes it easier because, uh, in my opinion, it's harder to write for a trio than it is to write for a quartet. Uh, some songs don't work so well in a trio that may work well in a quartet. 
And we were already up against that. Uh, when we recorded Life Before Insanity, we decided to bring a keyboard player in for about half of that record for that very reason. Uh, and it also uh, it helps that Danny and I have a, a songwriting history. We actually co-wrote the song Life Before Insanity. Um, and so we had written prior to Danny joining the band, you know, but uh, it was starting to make sense to us that some of these songs that I had written or that we had written in the past that didn't sound good as a trio, as an example, Soul Shine. We never played Soul Shine as a trio because we didn't like the way it sounded. But whenever we would have keyboards, all of a sudden we would play it and it would sound good. Uh, and so a lot of stuff after that, Beautifully Broken, which we wrote together, a lot of those songs just didn't sound good as a trio and did sound good as a quartet. So it's kind of a natural progression. Andy, how did it feel to replace Woody? Did it put you under a certain pressure? I would say, yeah, it, 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 there was some pressure involved. I mean, getting the gig, it was, I was very, very excited, but also it was a little daunting because, you know, everyone kind of had their eyes on me and, and, and I had to kind of step back and say to myself, well, these guys want me in the band, so I'm just going to try to be myself and not try to be like Alan, you know, who had a very specific way of playing and a very special way, and I don't play quite like that. I mean, I might take on some things, but it, yeah, it was, it was a little daunting at first, but then I kind of took a couple deep breaths and jumped into the cold water, and now it's warming up more and more, and <laughs> it, was, it wasn't easy, but, I, you know, it was challenging, and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Feel it. 
Thank you.
Still I 
just can't help yourself Say you wanna feel special, yeah You wanna make you feel like everybody else Take away your freedom Strip away your pride
um, in the past you wrote the songs, took them on the road, played them live and uh, recorded them afterwards. But with your latest album, Deja Voodoo, that changed. You rehearsed and recorded first and uh, without ever playing them live in front of an audience. Um, why the different approach all of a sudden? You know, that was a very unique experience yeah. for us. Uh, we had done that in the past, like uh, on Life Before Insanity, we did about half of that record that way. The other half was done uh, with songs that we had been playing on the road. And Dose, a little bit that way, but uh, Deja Voodoo was the first time we did a whole record that way. And I really, after doing the last Allman Brothers record and seeing with today's technology and the way we let people trade and tape the shows, it was obvious to me how many people had live performances, uh, live performances of every song that was going to be on the new Allman Brothers record. So when the record came out, it didn't have as much of an impact because people had already experienced those songs. It's, it's part of the whole tape trading process. If you allow people to tape your songs, you're going to run into this problem, really. You know, you know so we kind of decided, uh, you know, Let's, let's rehearse these songs, let's play them at sound check, but let's not play them in front of an audience. So when the record comes out, our entire fan base would experience them at the same time. Uh, and especially because it was such an important for, record for us, because it was the first record with Danny and Andy, the first record with the new band, and uh, I just wanted it to have as much impact as possible. Uh, it's not to say that we'll do the next one that way, but you know it was. I think it was effective, um, but there's there's also something to playing the songs in front of an audience. You can kind of uh, you can kind of learn things that way that you can't learn in the studio. You know, so there's there's good and bad to both sides. Um, Denny, you once said that playing with this band is like driving the fastest, most comfortable, best performing car you've ever been in. What does, what does that mean? <laughs> I, those are pretty long words. Let me, let me get my dictionary. Um, wow, it's a, it's a, uh, I'll have to think back at, at, at when I said that, but it, it, it sounds like what I meant uh, was that it's not only a musical experience that I have by giving myself, I feel like I'm taking a ride as I'm playing with this band. And I feel like I'm going on a journey in a very, very well-equipped vehicle. And I think that's what I was trying to say is that, that a great deal of the pleasure and the creativity that I experience by playing in this band is just allowing it to happen as if I was in the back seat and not driving. And uh, when I do drive, I feel like I've got all that power behind me. So it's, it was an analogy to describe the experience of playing live. Well put. Thank you. <laughs> you seem to get categorized as being a jam rock band. Can you, first, can you relate to that term? And do you feel particularly in tune with the jam band scene? Well, the jam band scene, um, is really made up of a lot of bands that improvise for a living. Uh, bands that don't play the same set list every night, that don't take the same approach to the songs every night. And uh, that's a great thing in itself, and that's somewhere that we definitely belong. Now, the flip side of that is a lot of the jam bands maybe take uh, a big cue from the Grateful Dead, which we don't necessarily take. Um, we're much more of a rock band than a lot of the bands that are considered jam bands. Um, but if jam band means a community of open-minded listeners listening to bands that are open-minded and trying to break new ground and not be informed by the mainstream and MTV, etc., mm -hmm. then that's a good thing. Uh, and in my opinion, then, if you take that back to the Grateful Dead and the Allman Brothers, then you should also include Led Zeppelin and Free and uh, Pink Floyd and Hendrix because they were jam bands too, you know. It's just that somehow 
the Grateful Dead and the Allman Brothers seem to be the two forerunners of the jam band scene. In our minds, there are a lot of other influences that we, you know, utilize that maybe some of these other bands don't. <laughs>
Thank you. We love you. We'll see you very soon.